high tech. Uh, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to see so many young families and young folks uh, uh, attending as well. Not a, not a majority, but uh, uh, this is a generational effort that we're all engaged in here. Um, I want to start with this. My, my topic tonight is an introduction to the Shroud. I know there are a lot of people here tonight that have uh, tremendous uh, interest, intellectual interest, in the Shroud of Turin. They've heard about it, they've done a little research possibly, and they want to learn more. So my uh, task tonight is to provide a little introduction and some context uh, for the rest of the uh, uh, conference, so that if you do attend some of the more technical sessions, you can put those in the right framework, you can understand where the presenters are coming from, and as Bob said, there will be some conflicts in some of the presentations. Uh, that's inevitable. But I want to start by, by mentioning something uh, very interesting here. Um, this all started in 1898. Bob mentioned the word syndenology. The image on the left is the shroud as you would see it in natural light, and it's, it's replicated here in the auditorium as well. John Jackson, who headed the CERT project in 1978, said when he got closer than about six feet to the shroud, all resolution was gone. You could not make out any detail inside about six feet. Others have said, I can make out detail at arm's length. But it essentially disappears in the natural shroud image, as you see it there. On the right is an image that began in 1898 with Segundo Pia. How many people have heard of Segundo Pia here? A handful, but not most of you. It wasn't until 1898 that the first photographs were taken of the object on the left. And in 1898, you had to go into your dark room and develop a negative before you could produce the positive of what you were taking the picture of. When Segundo Pia went into his dark room, that's what he saw on the right. He was shocked. He almost dropped the, the film. Uh, it was unheard of. It started this whole worldwide effort to understand what are we looking at in that image on the right. The image on the left is a very faint image on an ancient cloth, at least 1350. We know that because that's when it showed up in Europe. The image on the right is totally unlike that. It's almost photographic in its, in its content and in its resolution. One fifth of an inch resolution in the negative image. You can make out the lips, the nose, the beard, details that simply aren't accessible in the natural light vision of the shroud. Now, I've looked at some of the presentations here, and just for a quick orientation, on the man of the shroud, and you probably can't see it, but you will see it in some of the images I show you, on the left-hand side, the hands are crossed differently. Uh, remember, the shroud itself is a mirror image of the body wrapped in the shroud. Most often, when you see a negative image, not always, but most often when you see a negative image, it's as if the body was moved out of the shroud and you're looking at the body. So often the terminology, and it may be used during the presentations here uh, over the next couple days, shroud image to the left, that's exactly how the shroud looks, it looks like the right hand is over the left hand. In reality, the left hand of the body is over the right hand. This is called the body image. And you can tell quite often uh, there's a blood stain on the forehead. Uh, in the, on the natural shroud, it looks like the letter three reversed. And on the negative, it looks like the letter three as a letter three. Also, just for orientation, the left hand covers the right hand. The blood stain on the left hand side of the chest, you can see it here on the, on the negative, is on the right side. The blood stain is on the right side where the uh, chest wound occurred. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a cover of a book that was published just last month. There are some copies in the back 
Uh, they're for sale for half price because in shipping them here they got damaged. Uh, normally it's a $20 book. Uh, it's for sale. You can pick up a copy a little bit damaged for $10 if, if you'd like it. It's designed for the general public to give the information on the shroud so that the first time inquirer can gain a deep knowledge of what is known about the shroud. So it's called the Shroud of Turin, a critical summary of observations, data, and hypothesis. And it's produced by John Jackson, who's led the STIRP pro program and the research team at the uh, Turin Sh Shroud Center. Um, I'm giving the first uh, presentation tonight, other than Bob's introductory presentation. He mentioned the St. Louis presentation. I made the last presentation in St. Louis, the closing presentation. Joe Marino put me at the very last. Thank you, Joe. It was an honor. Um, but in that conference, uh, we were presenting version one of this document back in 2014. This, the printed version now represents version four of this document, which continues, because every year there's more research that gets added to the corpus of shroud research. So this is version four. Uh, it's also available online on the TSC website. But at St. Louis, I, I asked a question. It was a little different demographic at that conference. Uh, it was mostly researchers. Now, I know here tonight we have a lot of people that aren't researchers. They're inquirers on the shroud. In St. Louis, it was a little bit more heavily weighted towards the research community, although we have uh, the world's best researchers here in this conference as well. I asked a question. I said, how many here who have studied the shroud for at least two years, that was the implication, at least two years, have come to the reasoned judgment that you consider a rational judgment that the shroud indeed wrapped the body of Jesus of Nazareth in the tomb. About two-thirds of the hands were observed to be raised. I said, put your hands down. And I followed up with a second question. I said, of those that just put their hands up, how many has that judgment changed your life? And it was observed the same hands went up. Roughly the same hands went up. The shroud is an intoxicating but fundamental and existential reality in our world. And if you come to the decision, and it's a decision, it's a free judgment, there's nothing about the shroud that will impose a judgment of authenticity. And maybe that's the way it's going to be. If it's from who we think it might be from, that's probably the bottom line. It's not going to be coercive. But it's a rational judgment based on the corpus of evidence that this is the shroud of Jesus of Nazareth. And if you come to that reasoned judgment after you explore the, uh, the data on the shroud, it will change your life. Now you say, well, I'm a committed Christian and I really uh, don't need the shroud. Believe me, this is toxic in a way that is hard for our world to absorb. The shroud, if it's authentic and you come to that judgment, you can't help it but, but see it as a material sign of a deeper truth. And it will change you. Okay, so my purpose here really is to give you some background so the rest of this conference can be understood in the context of what we already know about the shroud. The critical summary presents an overview of the key evidence. Um, I'm going to go back. Um, in St. Louis, uh, one of the fellows that uh, I chatted with was uh, Giulio Fonti, who's a, a world-renowned researcher from Italy on the shroud. Uh, and he's making several presentations here at this conference. And in his uh, 2015 book, he related the same thing that he kind of related to me in St. Louis. And he said, if with authenticity, and this is what he said in his 2015 book, if with authenticity is meant a very old shroud around 2,000 years old, woven in the Middle East, which wrapped the corpse of a man who had been harshly scourged, who was crowned with thorns, 
and who died on the cross and could be identified with Jesus of Nazareth, then in this case, an answer can be sought, although not ultimate and with no sure scientific proofs. We're searching for scientific proofs. We may, may, it may be asymptotic. But Julia went on to say, the first author of the 2015 book, I have personally found his answer after 15 years of studies and intertwining correlations among the numerous clues, not only scientific. The shroud is authentic. That's Julio Fonti. So I wanted to relate that. But what we're talking about here now is some of the interrelated uh, intertwining evidence that Julia was talking about. The critical summary book that I just showed you the cover of is broken down into s seven uh, sections. And I think it would help any inquirer to find out what the shroud is all about, to think in terms of categories of evidence. If you go out to the internet today, if you're new to the shroud and you came to this conference thinking you're going to learn everything about the shroud, uh, you aren't. You're not going to learn all about it in two or three hours if, of attendance here. And if you go out to the internet, you're certainly not going to learn about it because there's all kinds of conflict out there. There's people that would that hate the idea that the shroud could be authentic, and they've got dozens of websites out there promoting that ideology. So it's difficult to learn on your own, but if you get the right book and you do the right approach to research, you can come to a reasoned judgment about the shroud. Whether it's authentic or not, you will be comfortable with a reasoned judgment. But you have to have some discipline and you have to look at things holistically and bring some discipline to the study. So the critical summary is, is organized in what we believe at TSC, John Jackson, uh, our leader said, there are seven categories. There's historical evidence, there's medical forensic evidence, there's linen cloth evidence, there's image characteristic evidence, there's image formation hypotheses, there's the rating of image formation hypotheses, and then there's this object and topic called dating the shroud. Those seven categories of evidence will help you organize what you hear in this uh, conference over the next several days. And what I'm going to do is walk through very briefly, because we don't have the time to go into 15 years of Fonte-like research. But we do have a chance uh, to look at some of the key data that will set the table for the rest of this conference in these seven areas. Historical evidence. I'm just going to go through some. Like uh, Bob said, he's a nuclear scientist. History is not nuclear science. It's a little bit more abstract in many ways. But there's tremendous corpus of evidence supporting the shroud. Let's talk about some of the locations. Jerusalem, obviously Jerusalem is a place of historical significance. If the shroud is authentic, it began in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Another place of historical significance, Antioch, north of Jerusalem in Syria. Edessa, you're going to hear about these two cities in talks this week. Edessa, about 145 miles northeast of Antioch. Kamuliana in Cilicia, in Turkey. A laser pointer? I, th I think the folks can see, but maybe not. Let's see. Okay, Kamuliana. Okay, Jerusalem, Antioch, Edessa, Kamuliana, Constantinople. The route in here is somewhat known, but there's some questions still. Between Constantinople and 1204, when it's uh, essentially certain the shroud was there, which makes the carbon dating uh, result wrong, we still don't know why it's wrong, but you're going to hear some theories this week. Um, but between Constantinople and Lyrie, France, where the shroud showed up for the first time in Europe in 1355, there's a gap of 150 years of silence on the shroud. We don't know where it was. Uh, Bassignon is in the area of Lyrie. It was the uh, uh, jurisdiction of Lyrie. Chambray, the shroud went through Chambray on its way to Turin. 
Oviedo is associated with the Sudarium of Oviedo. Those are the only places, if you want to learn about the history of the Shroud, if you master those locations and what may or may not have happened in those locations, you'll get a good grasp. Uh, Edessa, by the way, all of these cities uh, in the east at the time of Christ, uh, Jerusalem, Antioch, Gamuliana, Constantinople, were in the Roman sphere of influence. Edessa was not. It was in the uh, Parthian area of uh, control. They spoke uh, Syriac and not Greek. But in the first century, during apostolic times, uh, Edessa was evangelized because there were a large number of Jews in that city. So there is a connection to Edessa. It's a logical connection because early evangelists went there. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go pretty quickly through this. 70 AD. At the time of Jesus, Antioch was the third most important city in the Roman Empire. After the city of Rome and the Egyptian city of Alexandria. Peter visited Antioch in about the year 35 and is often given credit for founding the church there. There are some clues and hints that maybe Peter had possession of the shroud early on. Nothing definitive, but we know Peter was uh, hinted to have the shroud and he was in Antioch as early as 35. He didn't stay there, went back to Jerusalem, and but he was in Antioch early. In approximately the year 40, under the leadership of Barnabas and Paul, a number of Christian missionaries shifted their focus to the Gentiles. Antioch became the base for those great missionaries. St. Luke was a native of Antioch and wrote his gospel and the Acts of the Apostles in that city. In 70 AD, Antioch hosted the world's largest Christian community, and the term Christian was coined there. Antioch was to be called the cradle of Christianity. If the shroud went anywhere, naturally, Antioch is on the list of places it may have gone. 70 AD, the sack of Jerusalem. This is from the Sermon of Athanasius, written many years after the fact, but looks back at the time of the sack of Jerusalem. But two years before Titus and Vespasian sacked the city, Jerusalem, the faithful and disciples of Christ were warned by the Holy Spirit to depart from the city and go to the kingdom of King Agrippa II, because at that time Agrippa was a Roman ally. Leaving the city, they went to his regions and carried everything relating to our faith. At that time, even the icon, which with certain other ecclesiastical objects, were moved and they today remain in Syria. I possess this information as handed down to me from my migrating parents and by hereditary right. It is plain and certain why the icon of our holy Lord and Savior came from Judea out of Jerusalem to Syria. What was the icon? You almost in many cases have to look back at statements like this. Going forward and you encounter statements like this, they sometimes don't pitch, paint the whole picture. It's only looking back through time that some of these pieces start to make sense. And when you study the shroud, be patient with that. You can't just jump to conclusions. Uh, we can't jump to conclusions if the icon was the shroud. But Syria and Antioch, in hindsight, from what we know later about the shroud, make intuitive sense. So study with that in mind. Bob mentioned that, not to jump to judge the to conclusion. Sometime in, his, in the historical area in particular, you have to go backward and forward to get a good grasp of your judgment about the shroud. Okay, I'm jumping ahead to 540 AD. In 540 AD, there's lots of evidence between uh, 70 AD and 540, but we're, we're constrained by time, and I want to hit the high points. 540 AD, Antioch is invaded and destroyed by the Persians. Euphremius, the patriarch of Antioch, makes a deal with the Persians to save the great church in the city of Antioch. Essentially, everything else in the city was destroyed by the Persians. People who lived there looked back and said, 
After the fires and the, and the destruction of the Persians that attacked the city, I couldn't find where my house stood. It was almost total devastation. But the church, the great church of Antioch, was preserved because Euphrates said, you can have everything in the church, all the treasures, except Euphrates then went on a secret mission into Cilicia, an area located on the southern coast of the modern country of Turkey. Why and for what did Euphrates go into Cilicia? We're going to have to look back. Um, some background is important uh, concerning the patriarch Euphrates, though. In the 6th century, there were a number of appointments to high ecclesiastical office of prominent laymen chosen from the ranks of the army and or the imperial civil service. Euphrates, the patriarch of Antioch from 527 to 545, was one of these warrior bishops. After serving in, the, in an early inscription about Euphrates attested that sometime in his earlier career, he was the head of the central treasury of the entire Byzantine Empire. After serving in that capacity, he became the administrator of the entire eastern area of the Byzantine Empire with his headquarters in Antioch. And only then, after that, was he named Patriarch of Antioch. Shroud historian Jack Marquardt, who's here at this conference, and the preeminent history uh, expert on Antioch, the late Glanville Downey, both attest that the Patriarch Euphrates would not have fled in fear. Instead, they propose he may have been undertaking an important mission. Jack uh, Marquardt, by the way, will be making three presentations in the history area. Uh, he'll be grappling with some other uh, presenters, but listen carefully to, to those presentations by Jack and others that he's engaging. Archaeopieta. In the lobby, you saw an image uh, that represents an icon that points at an Archaeopieta, we believe. In 554, shortly after the fall of Antioch, an image of Christ appeared in Cilicia, the same place that Euphrates had gone during the attack of, of Antioch. A group of Orthodox priests publicly paraded an image of Jesus and pressed upon linen throughout Cilicia and Cappadocia. The image became known as the image of Camuliana. 554, Euphrates had died in 545. He never got back to Cilicia to reclaim any church property for Antioch. Church in Antioch was, had been devastated. There was silence from Antioch. So maybe prudence dictated if we have something important, but we know there was a cloth paraded in Cilicia. It took many years before that became public. The image became known, as I said, as the image of Camuliana. This image became the very first, the very first in all of history to be called Archaeopieta. This Greek word literally means not made by human hands. This iconic image emerged. There's a copy of it in the foyer. Of the Panacrator icon images and is considered the archetype for all other variations of the Panacrator icon. If you've looked at Greek and Byzantine history, you see very uh, a large variety of Panacrator icons. This is the first. Today it resides at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Desert. When the icon was first investigated in 1962, you see how recent some of this research is, 1962. Uh, Segundo Pio took his picture of the shroud in 1898. So it's really been just a little more than 100 years that shroud research has really been focused on, on getting the data. But in 1962, uh, this, this image was covered with a thick yellow varnish. The icon was carefully restored and the details of its restoration were published in 1967. Subsequent to its restoration, the icon was dated to CA 550, right after the image of Camuliana was paraded publicly, almost simultaneously, this iconic image appears, the most famous of all Greek iconic images. 
The renowned German art historian Hans Belting has stated the following about the Christ Pantocrator, which means ruler of all, almighty ruler, omnipotent lord of the universe. It apparently, quoting uh, Hans Belting, it apparently reproduces a well-known original of the time that determined the type of Christ preferred in Byzantine. The icon's general appearance, in fact, is derived from a concrete model whose identity is still an open question. For all its spontaneity, it was not invented by its painter, but seems to reproduce a famous for a given commission. So what is the archetype? Let me go back. Whoops. I got to go back several. I'm having trouble here. Here we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what is the archetype for this image? Uh, Shroud researchers Alan and Mary Wenger identified over 150 points of congruence between this image. They used a special technique called a overlay technique. It was a photographic technique. They identified over 150 points of congruence between this image and the shroud image. Generally, 65 to 70 points of congruence are sufficient to judge that the, same, that the images, the two images, belong to the same person. So there's great congruence between this image and the shroud image, particularly in the asymmetrical nature of the face portrayed here. Okay, 544. Just four years after Antioch was attacked by the Persians, so was Edessa. Just four years after the sack and destruction of Antioch, Khosros, the leader of the Persians, and his Persian army turned north to besiege the city of Edessa. In a close fight, the citizens of Edessa repulsed the Persian army, unlike in Antioch. Evadrius Scholasticus, writing in his ecclesiastical history, in approximately the year 590, described the battle for the city of Edessa and relates how an image of Christ of divine origin was given credit by the people of, the, of Edessa for their victory. The designation of Archeopieta, not made by human hands, was given to the image of Edessa just about 20 years after that same designation was given to the, sec, to the first Archeopieta, the image of Camulliana. The image of Edessa was thus the second image in history to be given this designation. Imperial appropriation of Archeopiate images. In 574, the image of Cumuliana is seized by the Byzantine Empire, Emperor and taken to Constantinople. After the image bearing cloth safely arrived in Constantinople, the Byzantines changed the name of the image to the name image of God incarnate. That became the name of the image once it arrived in Constantinople. You will hear about that in some of the presentations tomorrow. There are nine different, well, I think there's more than nine. There's more than nine presentations uh, on the history and it focuses right in on this area. In 943, the image of Edessa was seized by the Byzantine emperor and taken to Constantinople. As of this date, 943, both Archeopeda images, the one that first showed up on linen in Camulliana, and the one that showed up on cloth, supposedly linen, in Edessa, are both in Constantinople. Is one of them the shroud? Almost certainly. Which one? You'll hear more about the arguments tomorrow. Uh, shortly after, in, in historical terms, um, new icons tended to appear in uh, Byzantium. By the year 1164, a new iconic image had emerged in Byzantium, the Epitaphios or Thrinos image, and early examples given here. Shroud-like features, long hands, or long fingers, hidden thumb, uh, laid out 
like a burial image, shroud image, and there are markers that look like the shroud. Notice the uh, uh, odd treatment of the abdominal area. Uh, I think that's interesting. I don't know what I did with the clicker. Somewhere. I'm going to try to find it. Notice this area right in here. This odd treatment of the abdominal area. We're going to see that some more. Here's, a, here's another image of another epitophius image. This one's from about the year 1300. Also note the unusual treatment. This one is in Thessaloniki. Uh, still there, I believe. Uh, notice the odd treatment. If you back, but there's an odd treatment of that abdominal area. So art plays, uh, art his history plays a big factor in shroud research. Here's the Hungarian Prey Codex. Many of you may have heard of this, most probably have not. This is an image that was found in 1192 to 95 in Hungary. Very much shroud-like features. Uh, the arms are crossed at the wrist like the shroud back there. Uh, long fingers, no thumbs. Burial position laid out. In this case, there's no uh, modesty cloths at all, the body's naked. That's not in keeping with Byzantine sensibilities or Hungarian sensibilities. This is a naked body. Arms covering the private area. But that was unheard of it, really in Byzantium. They didn't paint naked images. But here's not only a naked image, but here's a naked image of the King of Kings in Byzant Byzantine terms. But down here you've got uh, the cloth, the burial cloth. Looks like a, uh, an artistic uh, a, attempt to reproduce the herringbone weave of the cloth. The red uh, crosses here are interpreted as blood stains. But there's another feature on this cloth which gives it away. These four holes are found on the shroud. And if you go back and look, you'll find them. I won't tell you where to look, but you'll see four sets of four holes on the shroud, the one displayed back there by the wall. That's a picture of, of one of those four sets. There are different locations because the shroud was folded into four, and it's supposed that in sets, maybe even in the first century, if the shroud is authentic, the shroud was used in an ecclesiastical rite, incense got it, and burned through four holes, the shroud being folded. It's on each layer of that folding pattern. But on the Prey manuscript right here where the circle is are those same four holes. One, two, three, four. That points directly at Constantinople and at the shroud. Now the source of the information used to craft the paper Prey Codex would appear to be unveiled given the following facts. From 1164 to 1172, the future king of Hungary, Bela III, was at the Byzantine court and became engaged to the emperor's daughter. In 1165, Bela III was designated to be the next emperor. In that capacity, he would have been permitted to view the image of God incarnate. Remember one of those two Archipiedas that had been taken to Constantinople way back in 574. But if you were going to be the emperor or were the emperor, you could view that image. It got caught up in the iconoclastic period that dominated Byzantium for several centuries. Images were not allowed. Images of God or his son were not permitted because to draw an image you had to put a border around it. And borders circumscribed what could not be circumscribed. So iconoclasm led to secrecy. And only the emperor, and Jack Marquardt may discuss this a little bit in the next two days, was given permission to view this image. But if Bella was going to be the emperor, he was also given permission, would have been given permission to view the image. 
When the emperor's son's manual, however, uh, produced an heir, Bela's engagement was canceled. In 1172, he succeeded to the Hungarian throne, and during the final decade of his rule, this image was crafted in Hungary. And as I said, this image points directly back at the shroud and at Constantinople. That's not a hard judgment to make. Uh, the image has the same... Is, is it proof? Make a judgment. You have to make a judgment. It's not going to be proof by itself. But all these things add up. And I'm just covering some of the high points. 1201 AD, the empirical, Imperial Relic Collection Inventory. Nicholas Meseratis was the overseer of the imperial, imperial relic collection that was maintained in the Pharaoh's Chapel of the Royal Palace in Constantinople. In 1201, he published an inventory of the linens in the collection. By this time, iconoclasm had passed. The image, both Archaeopeda images, were brought out, put into the imperial relic collection, and were viewed by more people, but not necessarily the public. In 1201, he published an inventory of the, of the items in the collection. He gave the following description of one of the items. The burial syndomes of Christ. These are of linen. They are of cheap and easy to find material and defying destruction since they wrap the uncircumscribed, fragrant with myrrh, naked body, after the passion, in this place, he rises again. Naked body again, not in keeping with common sentimentality and in Byzantium, but that's what they had, and that's what he reported. Again, the word uncircumscribed is used there. There's an interesting uh, iconoclasm said you can't circumscribe the divine. You can't have an image because you have to draw boundaries in that, around an image. <clears throat> uncircumscribed, he used here, if it refers to the shroud, take a look at the shroud. There are no boundaries on it. The image just disappears into the cloth. There are no discrete boundaries on the shroud. And Meseratis is saying that. The uncircumscribed, fragrant with myrrh, naked body after the passion. 1204. Three years later, the Fourth Crusade, diverted from going to the Holy Land to secure routes to the Holy Land, attacked Constantinople. This is the, from a memoir of a knight in the First Crusade, Robert de Clary. He stated that he had seen with his own eyes a cloth that was rise, raised up every Friday displaying an image of Christ. He wrote, There was another of the churches which they called My Lady St. Mary of Blasherne, where was kept the syndones in which our Lord had been wrapped, which stood up straight every Friday, so that the features of our Lord could be plainly seen there. And no one, either Greek or French, ever knew what became of the syndones after the city was taken. Fourth Crusade was led primarily by the French and Venetians. They were in the city. He saw this with his own eyes. 1204. There's another slide here I want to show you if I could find it. Okay. 1204-414. Uh, so after the Fourth Crusade, this image disappeared. Nobody knew where it went. And this icon appeared almost simultaneously with the uh, uh, migration of the Sindones out of Constantinople. Um, the icon provided a memory of the lost Sindos in which our Lord had been wrapped. And it was preserved in, in Byzantium through the art of the period in an icon known historically as the Man of Sorrows icon. The icon, this icon, provides an echo of the words written by Ms. Mike Nicholas Meserati's in 1201. In this place, he rises again. This is a strange icon. And by Robert de Clary, in which he records, the Lord stood straight up. The oldest known copies of the icon depict a dead, but inexplicably upright Christ, Jesus. 
The body simultaneously reflects unique aspects of the shroud image, the crossed arms at the wrist, the long fingers, the hidden thumbs, and the blood flow from the side wound. The man of sorrow's icon type generally shows the dead Christ riding, rising out of a coffer type of box. Oddly. Upright dead man. But that's what Nicholas Maserati, or Robert de Clary said he saw. Here's an image of just the top half of the shroud, frontal image. Does it look like that icon a little bit? Let me go back to the icon again. Look at the treatment in the icon of the stomach area again, like, like on the uh, epitaphios. Kind of strange, kind of strange. <clears throat> Here's the shroud. This is the top half of the frontal image of the shroud. <clears throat> now there's something here I want you to notice. I don't know if you can see this from where you're sitting. Those up front can see it. Right here is a big water stain right in the middle of the abdomen. When you look at the shroud back there against the wall, go look at that feature. It's, it's odd, you can't ignore it, and one of the strong theories is that it appeared in iconic images with the strange treatment of the abdominal area. It's an ancient water stain. By the way, I didn't mention, and just so you know, and for those that are new to the shroud, these, uh, these lines down here that bracket the body image, these are scorch marks from a fire that occurred in the year 1532. Miraculously, they did not destroy, that fire did not destroy the shroud image, but it did obliterate some of the shoulder and arm area. But these were scorch areas from 1532, after the shroud left Constantinople. When it was in Constantinople, those lines would not have been on the shroud. Uh, but there were water stains associated with the 1532 fire, but there's a series of ancient water stains, this being one of them, that way predate the 1532 fire. We don't know how old they are. They're potentially ancient water stains. There's some theories about that. I won't cover that tonight. This is an image of John Jackson, who I work with in Colorado, who headed up the Sturt Project. Uh, John was fascinated from the first day of the Sturp arrival in Turin. And it was a team of American scientists, large team of American scientists, that had access to the shroud for five days and five nights. They took tons of measuring equipment to Turin. This is back in 1978. And uh, it's the, the most uh, extensive direct examination of the shroud ever performed before or since was the Sturp project. John was fascinated by the fold lines that he saw on the shroud, because linen has kind of a memory, and fold lines, even if they're ancient, kind of leave a trace on the cloth. And here he is at a computer. This is an image of him on, uh, using a computer program to map fold lines that he saw on the shroud in 1978, and then verified in later years when he had access to the shroud again during some of the expositions. He was given access to look again. <clears throat> this is a uh, lifting device that John Jackson said is consistent with these fold lines, valley folds and peak folds, both ways, valley folds and ridge folds. He analyzed the folds and he said, hmm, ridge fold, valley fold, ridge fold, band of many folds plus a seven centimeter discoloration band. This in particular, the folds are hard to see unless you have special photographic images of the shroud or can examine it directly as a linen cloth. But this uh, discoloration band, knowing that it's there, go back and look and you'll find it. You'll see it, it's right there. <coughs> fold, three valley fold marks, one ridge fold mark. He constructed a prototype and said, gosh, the Byzantines were known for this kind of theatrical approach 
to liturgy. This might have been how Robert de Clary said the Lord was raised up every Friday in the church of St. Mary of Blacherne, and he rises again. Um, fold lines are empirical. They're there. Some people say, I can't see them. They're looking at photographs. They are there. They are compatible and consistent with such a lifting device, which prototypes have been built for. It nicely raises the front half of the shroud out of, the, out of a box-like coffer. Boom box-like coffer. That, that tends to be empirical, where the art often in some of the history cannot be considered empirical. So you've got art history and this empirical aspect. At least it's a, it's a, it's a evidence of empirical lifting device. Both of those predate the carbon dating of the shroud. Carbon dating the shroud is wrong if this is right. Unfortunately, we don't know why it's wrong, and it's important to tell the world why it's wrong, why it was wrong. There are several presentations at this conference. Joe Marino, Mark Antonacci, Bob Rucker will be discussing those issues. You're going to hear about that. What are they trying to do? They're not trying to uh, kill the carbon dating date. It's dead. The art, the history, this empirical evidence, the carbon dating date was wrong. But why it's wrong, we don't know. So most of the presentations on uh, carbon dating are trying to find why it was in error. Keep that in mind when you listen to those presentations. 1242, King Louis XIV or ninth, I'm sorry. Between 1239 and 1242, the French king, Louis IX, the future St. Louis, received 22 sacred relics from his cousin Baldwin II, the Latin emperor left in control at Constantinople. Among these relics was the encased Odessa cloth, the Mandelian. The building commissioned by St. Louis to house the rel relics stands today as the magnificent Saint-Chapelle chapel in Paris. I don't know, has anybody been there? Is it the most beautiful place you've ever been? Uh, this is renowned as one of the most beautiful buildings ever built. It was uh, consecrated on the 26th of April, 1248. 1248, people. This building, if you've been there, you know it, how beautiful it is. And it was constructed specifically to house these relics that were sent to Constanti from Constantinople to King Louis. Uh, and the Mandelian was one of those. So one of the Archipeda images supposedly went to Saint Chapelle. We're going to hear about that tomorrow. What was it? What happened to it? Was it the shroud? Was it not the shroud? You're going to hear some presentations about that tomorrow. 1355, the shroud appears in Lyry, France. But this is 150 years later than Robert de Clary's statement that the shroud disappeared in Constantinople. The family never indicated, the family that had possession of the shroud never indicated how they received the shroud. All they said was, Lerbo letter oblatum. And that was the person that found it, Geoffrey de Jory and his wife, Jean de, Ver de Vergy. And that is freely given. We don't know how they got it yet. We're going to hear some presentations tomorrow with some strong evidence and hypothesis that explains where Geoffrey de Charnay acquired the shroud. So if you listen to that presentation, that can be absolutely groundbreaking. That can change the whole equation for the world about the shroud. Because people have said, well, it disappeared in 1204 from Constantinople, and then it appeared, something appeared in uh, uh, Lyry, France. Well, we know what appeared in Lyry, France was the shroud, but that was the beginning of the shroud. It really didn't connect back through that 150 years. Uh, the presentation tomorrow may clear up a lot of things. Something needs to be said about Geoffrey de Charnay, who had custody of this. It is of note that Geoffrey de Charnay was referred to even during his life as the true and perfect knight. 
He was the author of at least three works on chivalry and was perhaps Europe's premier knight during his lifetime with the reputation for great skill at arms and also for great piety and honor. On more than one occasion, he was given the great honor of carrying the Olaflam, the battle standard of the King of France, into battle. Geoffrey lost his life at the Battle of Poitiers while carrying the Olaflam on 19 September 1356, not, more than, not much more than one year after he first displayed it in Europe, after 150 years of obscurity. How did he get it? What kind of man was he? He was a very honorable, famous knight in France. And all of a sudden, the shroud, not an Archaeopieta, but the shroud today that's in Turin, Italy, was in his possession. How to get there? We're going to hear more about that tomorrow. That's important. There will be some arguments. People are going to be fighting it out, duking it out. Um, so if you go there, it's not because we don't know what we're talking about. We're trying to squeeze this data down to the final facts. What are we going to know? Because it changes the whole equation if we can clear up some of these mysteries. Um, <clears throat> now the shroud from Lyrie, France, it went uh, eventually from the uh, family of Geoffrey de Charnay to the House of Savoy, a very prominent uh, medieval ruling family, which eventually became the royal family of Italy. And um, it was not deeded over to the church, the Catholic Church, until the death of the last king of Italy, who was uh, uh, died in Portugal in exile after being the, the king of Italy at the time of World War II. So the shroud stayed in the hands of private individuals and families up until that time when it finally got uh, deeded to the church. The big question is the missing years. We've talked about that. 1204, the shroud is in Constantinople. It's one of those two Archaeopeda images, either the image of God incarnate or the image of Edessa. You're going to hear arguments both ways tomorrow. But we know in 1355 it showed up. The problem is we only have one of the Archaeopeda images in our custody today, and it's the shroud until it during Italy. And you say, well, what difference does it make then? We have the shroud. Who cares what the other image was? Well, it makes a great deal of difference to close the, the, the questions. Uh, we need to know what happened to that other image. What was the other image? We have the shroud. Which Archaeopeda image was it? And what happened to the other Archaeopeda image? It appears to be lost. I wish we could find it. If we could find that second Archaeopeda image, uh, the world would be changed in a snap. Shroud, Shroud's authentic period almost becomes coercive at that time. I don't think the Shroud can ever be coercive because of what it represents and who it represents. It's not in the way. It's not the way. But those arguments will be posed tomorrow. Okay, medical forensic. I'm going to go faster now. History is fascinating. There's the most presentations at this conference will be in the area of history, interestingly enough. Not nuclear science. History. So pay attention to those. Medical forensics. Uh, this is a, a close-up of the face, the letter 3. This is a, obviously a negative of the letter 3 on the forehead. Also notice the blood flows around the top of the head, just to point them out. Uh, consistent with the crown of thorns, this is a blood stain in the area of uh, image of a letter 3, or number 3. Notice the left cheek is more swollen, or the right cheek, I'm sorry, the right cheek is more swollen than the left cheek. It's whiter. There's more image there. It was closer to the cloth. If the image is related to being closer to the cloth, that's why the image shows that way. The face, the nose looks like it's broken. Um, and the right cheek is distinctly swollen. Remember the Panicrator? When we showed that, the, the Panicrator has a very asymmetrical face. 
And if you block one side and then the other, you can see the significant asymmetry there. The shroud face is asymmetrical also. This is a close-up of the back. Not only was the back scourged, the front of the body was scourged. Notice the, uh, in, in particular, uh, here you can see the uh, dumbbell style or dumbbell type wounds. They're all over the back, but here it's enlarged, consistent, totally consistent with the Roman scourging instrument. Uh, it's even been analyzed to note that the, that the back shows kind of a crossing pattern. And this has been analyzed to, to determine that two people scourge the body. Uh, there are different angles on the left and right, which means probably one of the persons scourging the uh, victim was taller than the other. It wasn't just one person that went from one side then to the other. It was two people taking turns, whip, 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 because the angle of the scourge marks are different, indicating a different uh, height of the, of the tormentor. Um, on the front of the body, there are 159 scourge marks. The front was scourged also, as I mentioned, 159 scourge marks on the front of the body, 213 on the back. Brutal. We're going to hear about the, uh, uh, the death of Christ in one of the presentations. There are two presentations on medical forensics, that's all. One of them has to do with the, uh, with the death and the cause of death. The scourging was so severe, it could have caused death from hypovolemic shock. I couldn't take it, I know that. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an interesting piece of archaeological find. In 1968, a skeletal heel bone with a seven-inch long Roman nail driven through it was discovered in an ossuary or bone box inside a first century tomb in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Significant finding. If you remember the Jesus Project back in the 60s and 80s, said, oh, victims of crucifixion were simply thrown in a ditch to be eaten by birds and and wild animals. They weren't the released for burial. Being crucified did not warrant a Jewish burial. Wrong. But we didn't know that for sure until 1968 when a heel bone was found in an ossuary. So crucifixion victims were released for Jewish burial. At least some of them. So on the shroud we see the bottom of the two feet right foot. There's, uh, this is blood, blood, right foot, left foot. Lots of blood on the bottom of the feet. This blood flow off the uh, side of the foot is interesting. It means that forensically we don't know. The, the most traditional way that we see the, the, the body crucified is with a nail through the top of the feet with the two feet crossed. But it could have been that the, that the feet were nailed through the heel, particularly that blood stain on the right. It's, co it's consistent with either method, is what we must say. This is the two hands crossed. Uh, the left hand has a large, uh, large blood stain at the wrist here and then blood up and down the arms as well. These white, remember the negative, white is blood, red. It shows the dark things on the shroud show up light in the negative image. This is a blood stain at the wrist, not in the palm of the hand. The palm of the hand's down here, it's in the wrist. We know that too because forensic people have actually crucified cadavers and they know that it won't hold through the hand, it'll tear loose. So the Romans crucified through the wrist to catch some of the bone structure to support the weight of the body, consistent with that on the shroud in the wrist. This is simply a, a, a manipulation of this photo to raise that left hand into the crucifixion position. <clears throat> Notice the flow of gravity, the direction of that blood flow, the blood on the arms. Notice the direction of the blood flows direction of gravity. You look at the shroud, you wouldn't notice that. 
So there will be some, uh, a couple of interesting, just two though, because the medical forensic evidence is so convincing. We don't need to discuss it anymore. This man was crucified. This man was excruciatingly crucified and whipped. It was an excruciating beating and then crucifixion. Totally consistent with the gospel narratives, but even more horrible. And here it is. These are almost, the shroud negative is almost like a photograph. And when we look at image characteristics and image hypotheses, the most close to the actual image on the shroud is a photographic hypothesis. We're looking at a man who was crucified. Why was he crucified? We don't know. If we have faith, we have an idea he was crucified for us. But what a torment he went through. Linen cloth evidence. I'm not going to say any more about uh, medical forensics. There's a large corpus of additional things that can be said in all of these areas. Linen cloth evidence. The Shroud Conservation Project of 2002 stabilized the layout of the shroud by stretching it out for flat storage. The reported post-preservation dimensions are 14 feet 6 inches by 3 feet 9 inches. The shroud, however, was not woven to these dimensions. Instead, these dimensions are only approximate measurements for an ancient cloth that has been handled, stretched in varying ways, and manipulated for centuries. Consequently, the more accurate specified dimensions of the shroud, that is, the dimensions used for those who crafted this cloth, are more likely in cubits. A weaving specification of the shroud of eight cubits by two cubits would conform closely with the ancient Assyrian cubit of approximately 21.7 inches, 55.1 centimeters, that was used in the area of Palestine in the first century. This is a close-up of the cloth itself. A micrograph made during the Stirp project of the cloth itself shows the weaving pattern of the cloth. It's a herringbone weave. The cloth is woven in a three-to-one herringbone twill. Nothing comparable to the shroud has been found that originated in medieval Europe. Nothing. The late John Trier, a textile researcher in Manchester, England, studied the X-radiographs of the shroud taken during the Stirp expedition. He wrote, the shroud is a very poor product by comparison to medieval European fabrics. It is full of warp and weft weaving defects. The impression I am, the impression I am left with is that it was a cloth is much cruder and probably earlier fabric. I think this lifts the shroud out of the Middle Ages more than anything I have seen about the textile. This is the textile expert speaking. So shroud research is broad. Uh, when the radiocarbon dating of the shroud was done in 1988, <clears throat> one of the things they wanted to do was find a control sample from the Middle Ages that could reasonably match the shroud. So they could control test a, a known medieval uh, linen cloth that matched the shroud. Nothing could be found. John Jackson was actually contacted as well. John, do you know of any other cloth like this that we can acquire as a, as a sample that can be a control sample for the radiocarbon? Nothing could be found. It can't be seen in this picture either. Let me go back. I'm sorry. It can't be seen in this picture, but there's banding in the shroud. And you can see it best in backlit photographs where you can see these dark bands that go through the shroud. Uh, those are consistent with weaving of ancient linen because different samples of thread were redded separately and then woven separately. And so you got the banding, the different hanks of thread were different in color. It conforms to the uh, specifications that Pliny the Elder used in the first century for making linen. Medieval linen didn't have that banding. They had figured out you don't ret the separate hanks of cloth or thread because you get banding, so let's do it all together. So medieval cloth typically doesn't have that banding. By then, it wasn't, but the shroud has it. Another pointer back to first century provenance. Okay. 
still talking about the linen cloth. Now, when we talk about the linen cloth, we're not just talking about the cloth, but we're, fine, we're talking about what's on the cloth besides the image. Now, this is a picture of Max Fry, the man on the right, is taking sticky tape samples from the shroud during the 1978 uh, Sturt project. To the back and the background to the left is uh, the Sturt chemist, Ray Rogers. Fry here is making an effort to collect samples of pollen from the cloth. Fry was recognized during his lifetime as one of the foremost criminal forensic scientists in Europe. In 1948, he was the founder of the Zurich, Switzerland Central Police Scientific Department. He undertook this project early in his retirement years. Now we're going to find some of this evidence is somewhat ambiguous, but it's telling too and it adds weight. Uh, there are roughly 380,000 species of plant that have thus far been identified on Earth. The scientific study of the pollen of these plants is the branch of the science of botany known as palynology. Forensic palynology is the discipline that focuses on, pal on pollen found on an object of investigative interest criminal, historic, or archaeological as potential evidence that can place that object in a certain place at a certain time of year. Not so much in the United States, but in other countries, paleontological forensic, paleontolog paleontological evidence can be used in court. We found pollen from this place where the body was dumped places this suspect in that location. I need other evidence to collaborate it, but it's used in court. One of the factors that makes forensic paleontological, paleontolo paleontology possible is that the outer wall of a pollen grain, the exine, and you see a picture of a pollen, this is a electron microscope picture of one pollen grain. Can't see it with the naked eye. Uh, the outer cover of that the exine is composed of one of the most chemically inert polymers known to exist. Pollen can last millions of years. I didn't know that. Most of you probably don't know that. But it also has a fingerprint that because of the biodiversity of trees and plants in certain areas, uh, the pollen from a certain area gives a fingerprint of that area. Max Fry analyzed, he got 56 pollens that he analyzed over a course of a number of years during his retirement, and he identified 56 pollens that he could identify with the area of Palestine, Anatolia, where Cilicia is, Constantinople, France, and Italy. Now, he died before he completed his work. Uh, it's not sound to make a firm commitment that the shroud had to be in those areas, but it's supporting collaborative evidence. There's more that can be done in this area. The custodians of the shroud have not allowed new samples to be taken, but the science of paleontology, forensic paleontology, has, has progressed uh, tremendously since the time of Max Fry more testing can be done. Nobody's promoting that really right now because there's other issues that are, seem to be more important. But he found the shroud likely was in those areas. And it is a science, forensic paleontology. Temple steps in Jerusalem. Temple was destroyed in 78, but 78 AD, but these steps are still there. Sturt team members Roger and Mary Gilbert while doing ultraviolet spectroscopy scanning of the dorsal image area of the shroud during the STIR project, detected unusual signals when they reached the area corresponding to the soles of the feet, where we saw those blood stains. They immediately called for the assistance of optical physicist Sam Pellicori, who brought his portable, portable microscope over to examine the area. Shroud historian Ian Wilson in his book, and I'm getting, Bob's giving me the time out. You want me to stop? Can I go on for five minutes more, Bob? Okay. Brought his microscope over, and 
his statement was, it's dirt. Dirt on the feet. Subsequently, they looked more carefully. Dirt on the nose, dirt on the left knee. All of which is consistent with other things that we find in the gospel that Christ died. Let me go very quickly. I'm going to do a couple more things because it's, uh, I think it's important. Image, image characteristics. This is uh, the most densely colored area on the whole shroud. It's by the nose. Each of the threads portrayed here has about 120 fibers in it. The fibers themselves are what bear the, the image. The image is on only the fibers individually. And you can see here that not even all the fibers in this most densely, densely uh, colored area are colored. And the fibers are th thinner than a human hair. And the color goes around the fiber, but doesn't penetrate to the medulla of the fiber. Remarkable. Extreme superficiality of the image. Almost inexplicable. By contrast, the blood areas uh, show capillary flow and also cementation between uh, different fibers. There's no cementation between the fibers in the image area, only in the blood area. And I'm going real fast now because I've been given this image I'd like to talk about. Uh, this was done at the Air Force Academy in 1976. John Jackson was teaching uh, physics at the Air Force Academy, and he had a picture of the shroud, and he was familiar with an uh, image analyzer that was used by NASA and others to do image analysis, and he said, I'd like to put the shroud picture on that. And so uh, a, a person that he knew, Pete Schumacher, an engineer with interpretation systems, uh, brought a... Uh, an instrument over to the Air Force Academy to make a brightness map of the shroud. He said, I hadn't known about the shroud before, but what happened next was extraordinary to me. The results were, to say the least, unique. The nose ramped up in relief. The facial features were contoured properly. This result from the VP-8 had never occurred with any of the images I had studied nor had it, I heard of it happening during any image studies done by others. No other image produces these same results. Uh, Jackson and Jumper were both officers teaching physics and aeronautics at the Air Force Academy. The STIR project was born at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Image formation hypothesis, very quick. If you give me three minutes, Bob, I can, I can wrap it up real quick. There's three different categories of image hypotheses. Dead body alone, two, two routes to an image through a dead body, either contact, direct contact with water, oils, perspiration on the image, or gas, cadaverine, uh, uh, decomposing body gives off gas, possibly the gas reacted with the image. Two image uh, hypotheses with the dead body alone, artistic creation, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then radiation. Rating the image hypotheses. There's only one presentation even talking about rating the image presentations at this conference. You can't see this very good, very well. But all of the dead body alone doesn't work. It doesn't work. All the tools to analyze this are known. Uh, they've been discounted. Dead body alone doesn't work with the 17, and, and Jackson has used 17 image characteristics rating each of these. And, and people in the, in the history of shroud studies Dead body alone doesn't work. Artistic creation doesn't work. The closest is a, is a medieval camera obscura because the image is close to being a photograph, but it doesn't work either. We're driven over to the right side of this to radiation or electric field. Everybody that he, that's here that is a scientist that studies the shroud knows this. You may not know it, so you're going to hear argument. All those arguments are way over here on the extreme right. Radiation, light, looks like the only possibility for the image on the shroud. 
the others have been shown to be inconsistent in multiple areas by our book back there. It gives you the details of how those great ratings are done. So when you hear controversy, be aware it's not controversy about image formation. It's image formation driven to the extreme right into the area of radiation is the only possibility that serious shroud scientific researchers now consider a possibility. You're going to hear some variations on that from Bob Rucker, Mark Antonacci, Giulio Fonti, and others over the next several days. Dating the shroud, there are several presentations. What I want to say here only is this. We can be confident the dating is wrong. There's too much evidence that the shroud was in Constantinople in 1204, and that says the carbon dating of 1290, 1260 to 1390, is wrong. And besides that, uh, Joe Marino is going to talk about the sample. Only one sample was taken. Leading up to carbon dating, there was a complicated uh, system of uh, planning that was put together called the Turin Protocol. They were going to take multiple samples from different places on the shroud. They didn't. They only took one sample from the worst possible place, according to Alan Adler, a STIRP member. Uh, right down here in the corner of the frontal image, right down in the corner, is ancient water stain in here as well. We're going to hear about that corner. But only one sample was done, and it came up with a date that the Constantinople uh, presence makes it. But we don't know why. So we haven't explained it yet. So it's important to the public to say, well, when the carbon dating was announced in uh, 1988, the shroud went into a kenosis, like the kenosis of Jesus Christ in the incarnation. The public turned away, scientists turned away, said, well, that's it carbon dating. Um, after 1978 in Stirp, there was a general interest in the shroud. Cross Gen National Geographic had a big article on it. After the carbon dating, it went quiet. We're still in that era, but we're very, very close to breaking out of that era. And this conference may have profound effect on doing that. I'm not going to do that. Concluding comments. Um, I won't do any concluding comments. I hope this piqued some of your interest in all of these areas, but use those categories to look at what you hear this week. Don't just hear it in, as disjointed people arguing with each other. They don't know what they're talking about. They do, but they're in very small areas of discussion. The, the missing years between 1204 and 1355 is a big deal. Eight presentations being made at this conference on that topic. If we can get some coherence in that, but these guys that are presenting have very different ideas. So you're going to hear some people that don't sound like they know what they're talking about, but they're in a micro area focused on that. The bigger picture is the St. Louis picture. Two-thirds of the hand went up. I judge the shroud to be authentic. And the evidence supports that, but uh, use your own judgment. You're free to do that, of course. I don't think the shroud will ever be coercively proven, but uh, it's difficult to look at all this evidence, to which I've just touched on, and say, hmm, there's no coherence in that judgment. There simply is. So thank you for your patience. I know that I was trying to pu uh, punch a lot into a short presentation, but hopefully that was of some help to you and not confusing. Bob, thank you.